It's midnight in the French Quarter, New Orleans. You're walking down an empty cobblestone street, all alone, flanked by ancient Creole cottages and French houses with balconies and uh, Spanish wrought iron railings. There's fog rolling on off the Mississippi River, and it's uncharacteristically cool this night. There's a chill in the air. You pass by a dark alley, you hear your name whispered. Curious, but a little drunk, so you're not too scared. You stop and turn. A beautiful young woman steps out of the alley, smiles seductively. She approaches you and whispers something in your ear, something suggestive. You've had a few too many drinks, so you smile. She draws closer, opens her mouth, extends her fangs, and plunges them deep into your carotid artery. She sucks all the blood from you, and you fall down dead, a husk of a human being. You've been struck by a vampire. That's right. Welcome to Fangs and Folklore, the Internet's premier horror... Well, what do we call it? I guess it's a podcast and a video, right? A YouTube channel and so much more. I'm your host, Matthew Miller, expert in all things paranormal, monster, horror, scary, creepy, and just plain weird. So welcome friends, fans, foes, fanatics of Fangs and Folklore. You're broadcasting here from the studio in the basement of the abandoned castle in the middle of the haunted forest. And the castle cats are very active tonight, being a little naughty. So uh, if, uh, you know, if you see some movement in the background, I hope it's just the cats. Yeah. Check out my books on Amazon. I'm a horror writer. The first one is called Blood Feud, a punk rock vampire story. It's a six-part series. And I promise you it's unlike anything you've ever read before. It's horror comedy, and I can guarantee it's entertaining. If you like to be scared and you like to laugh, who doesn't? You will love these books. So check them out on Amazon. All available, paperback, audiobook, and Kindle. All right. I was going to do another UFO episode, but an article came up this week that I, um, that I came across that talked about one of my favorite New Orleans lore of stories, you know, and I couldn't resist talking about it, so forgive me. If you want to hear more about aliens and UFOs, leave a comment and we'll do those. There's a fascinating legend known in the French Quarter of New Orleans. Now, if you're not familiar with the city, the French Quarter is the original city. It was where it was first established. It's below sea level. It's the oldest part of the city, older than, you know, America itself, and the architecture and layout look very European and not American. Think narrow streets, French and, French and uh, Creole houses, Spanish wrought iron railings, balconies, houses that sit right on the street without yards. It's charming and dark and old and creepy and filled with stories, but also restaurants, bars, residents, tourists, all sorts of fun. It's centered around Jackson Square and the St. Louis Cathedral. Like uh, It was built like French cities are built, at least traditionally, where they're around a town square and there's a church at the head of the square. It's got all the trappings you would expect of such a place. Multicultural, great restaurants, great bars, mafia influence, <laughs> extremely haunted, filled with dark, spooky stories and legends. And one such legend involves my personal favorite supernatural creature, the vampire. You probably have guessed over the years that I like vampires. Not sure if I'd like to meet an actual one, but I like the concept. And I've talked about the history of vampirism in other episodes of Fangs and Folklore. Originally, vampires were, well, they were risen corpses, basically. Come back from the dead, they would visit their families at night, demanding food and sex, and often drinking blood. It wasn't until much later, many people say Bram Stoker's novel Dracula, which was, what, 1897, I believe, that the concept of kind of a suave, sophisticated count, uh, romantic, seductive count as a vampire came to be. Before that, they were really like rotting corpses. A lot like zombies, but actually sentient and intelligent. So, concept, concept of the vampire is a lot older than just Dracula, you see. Let's talk about the Ursuline vampires of the French Quarter of New Orleans. The story begins with a predicament that the crown of, uh, of France found itself in when trying to colonize New Orleans. No one wanted to move there. Think about it. New Orleans was deadly hot, humid, swampy, below sea level, filled with malaria and other diseases. Got alligators, mosquitoes, snakes, all sorts of, you know, uh, snapping turtles, all sorts of pests. And you couldn't, it was hard to build or farm there because it was below sea level. You had to drain the swamps first, build the levees. If you remember Katrina, the hurricane that destroyed New Orleans several years ago, uh, the problem was that the water burst through the levees. See, without those levees, there is no New Orleans. And so when New Orleans began to be colonized, uh, Louis XIV, Louis XIV, was the king of France, Le Roi Soleil, the Sun King. But then he died, and the regent Philip the, uh, Philippe II oversaw the founding of the city. And the French crown saw that no one wanted to move there, so they said, all right, who can we force to move there? Three kinds of people. Soldiers, they have to obey orders. Convicted criminals, they have no choice. Prostitutes, so they were also considered criminals. 
And that explains a lot regarding, regarding modern New Orleans, I think, but I digress. Soldiers, prostitutes, and criminals. So the problem was that uh, people, they started moving there. Some people started moving there from the old world, and men wanted to find wives and, and you know, build a family. But they wanted to marry women who were not prostitutes. And I'm not shaming sex workers, but that's, their, that's historically what they, how they felt. So any women who wanted to move there also wanted to be assured of meeting a good man, not a criminal, not a, a drunk, you know, not an abuser. So enter the Catholic Church. The Church established missions and monasteries and convents and churches in the New French Territory, including Louisiana and New Orleans. It began sending girls and young women voluntarily, you know, not against their will, from France to travel there to provide the men with decent women to marry, decent virgins. That's their words, not mine. For many women in poor rural France on their families' farms who saw little future except joining the church as a nun or getting married off to some dirty old man against your will, you know, there's not so much hope to rise up in society or, or have any kind of a good life. This was exciting. It was an opportunity. So we can go to the new world, this amazing, strange new city, and maybe meet a man. Maybe, you know, in the new world, it's supposed to be different. Maybe we can actually make a fortune, and many women did. Now, so before this, in July of 1727, 12 Ursuline nuns left France for New Orleans and built a convent there. Now, the original French architect who built it built it out of exposed brick. Bad idea because the humidity destroyed it, so a couple of years later he had to rebuild it in another style. But it's, it's been there since um, 1735. It's the oldest building in New Orleans, the oldest building in the entire Mississippi Valley, and one of the oldest buildings in the U.S. Well, European buildings. Let me make that point. People were living here just fine for tens of thousands of years before the Europeans showed up, but uh, one of the oldest European buildings in the U.S. Uh, it was, by the way, the Ursuline Order was founded in 1535 by St. Uh, Saint Angela Merici. It was the first Catholic order that was dedicated specifically to the education and benefit of uh, girls and women. So that's interesting. So the convent still stands there today, the Ursuline Convent. It's uh, 1100 Charter Street. You can go there today, walk right up to it and see it with your own eyes, touch it. Can't miss it, it's huge. Well, in 1728, the French crown and the Catholic Church combined forces to send a party of virtuous young virgins, their words, not mine, to New Orleans so that the local men could marry virtuous women and uh, make families. And so New Orleans would become um, not only stable and more populated, but also, you know, they could, in theory, uh, combat the non-virtuous behavior. Oh, sorry, my lighting here having a few problems. The non-virtuous culture of New Orleans that was becoming kind of infamous. So yeah, so the, um, the church sends these women. Well, uh, they had sent others too, like the Mobile, Alabama, and other places, so they get around in New Orleans. All right, so a ship arrives at port one day, or one evening actually, and a shipload of pale, thin young women exit, walking on the dock. Compared with the sun-drenched kind of olive skin of the people of New Orleans to this day, the same, they were decidedly pal, French word for pale. The men saw them on the docks, the dock workers just said, pal, bizarre, huh? They're strangely pale. The girls were reclusive and pale and kind of thin. You might say after a, you know, that long at sea, maybe you would be pale and thin. They weren't allowed up to work the ship. They were kept below deck, maybe, okay? Now, um, here's where the story gets weird. Each girl carried a French word casquette. Casket, they were called les filles à la casquette meaning the casket girls. The question though, some argue, the word wasn't casquette originally, it was cassette, which is an, a, a word, an older word for a traveling trunk, like for luggage. So were they les filles à la cassette or les filles à la casquette? Well, the legend says casquette, they carried little caskets. That's a little odd, isn't it? So the girls are taken into the Ursuline convent by the nuns, that was the plan, and placed up in the third floor attic to live with their casquette. Hmm. Now, here's where the story really gets fun. Legends began going around, rumors began flying, that people were disappearing at night in the area of the Ursuline convent. Bodies found drained of blood. Now, people saw that the attic windows had been nailed shut. Still are. You can go 1100 Charter Street to this day. Look up third floor, the windows are boarded shut. Um, they would be nailed shut so that no light could enter. Uh, so the story starts circulating that, hey, these girls actually, they weren't vampires themselves, but their casquettes held vampires. The girls were kind of like servants to the vampires, like Renfields, right? Female Renfields. So there were vampires living in the third floor of the Ursuline convent. 
that's the story. And so um, things start happening. Those who had business inside the convent, for whatever reason, noted that the attic was off limits, the door was closed and nailed shut. You could go up there, draped with crosses. A carpenter claimed that he had been instructed to nail all the attic windows shut, to nail the uh, attic door shut, and that he had been given nails that had been personally blessed by the Pope to use to nail the windows and the door shut so that nothing evil could open them and cross, you see. He had also been asked to cut small holes like hatches in the floor, not big enough for a person to go through, but you could slip food through, food, whatever that may have been, without the nuns having to physically go up in the attic. What were they sliding through the holes? Food for the girls, sure. Food for the inhabitants of the casquettes, blood, sacrifices, atonement to keep themselves safe. Les filles à la casquette, the girls themselves eventually did end up marrying local men. Many were disappointed as the local men ended up often being alcoholics or abusers or cheaters or worse. And in those days, of course, in the 1700s, uh, women did not have many rights. It's not a whole lot you could do if your husband was a no good, you know, abusive drunk or something. You, not much you could do, you know. You didn't have many rights. And so you kind of just had to take it and be miserable. So a lot of those women were disappointed. Um, and that's where the stories fade, just as does the sunlight at the end of every French Quarter day and the beginning of every French Quarter night, where the city comes alive with many things, alive and undead. What about the vampires in the Ursuline attic? You can go there yourself today, see, the windows are still shut up. You can go inside, it's a museum now, but you're not allowed to go in the attic. You can't go. Some people have made it into the attic, gotten either private tours or snuck in somehow, um, at night maybe. Not, not just, I'm not saying you should go break in, but it's been done. And so some have described a dank, dark place, lots of hidden corners with closets, cabinets, casket-shaped, uh, casket box-shaped cutouts in the floor. And I don't know anyone yet who'd been brave enough to open them, but they've seen them. And let me say this, all the pictures, the photos I'm showing you in this episode are real. They're from the Ursuline convent. They're not from a movie or made up. They're real. Now, um... <clears throat> what do you think? Are the Ursuline vampires just a legend born of the mystery and darkness of the French Quarter? Were there real vampires there? Are they still there? Did they escape into the night? Vampires don't die. They're immortal unless they're staked or burnt. Something like that. So, you know, there are many, many legends of vampires in New Orleans. And I've known people who've sworn up and down that they've been allowed to meet vampires in the French Quarter and other parts of the city. Just a moment, I'm going to tell you a story, but what do you think about the Ursuline vampires? Are they still there behind those boarded windows, behind that nailed shut attic door, being fed blood by nuns or by whoever is there today? Nuns don't live there anymore as a convent. Are they desiccated, having not had blood for so long, just waiting for a person to go up and be drained of their blood and be fed? I don't know. All right, I'm going to tell you a tale. This is truly something that was told to me by a friend of mine. I'm going to call her Jeanne like Jean d'Arc, Joan of Arc. That's not a real name, but I want to protect her privacy. We're going to call her Jean, uh, Jean. She's real. She really told me this story. Okay. So she grew up in New Orleans East, which is like across the river. It's, New Orleans is called the Crescent City because the river bends in a crescent and kind of reverses itself. And so the West Bank is New Orleans East somehow. It's really weird how it works out. But anyway, she knows the entire city like the back of her hand. Now, in the 2000s, she had fallen into the trap of addiction to heroin and had spent many nights in the French Quarter and some of the sleaziest spots there trying to get a fix. Now, thankfully, she has since gotten clean. She's now, at least last I heard, a yoga instructor, living a good, healthy, good life, uh, free of addiction, so thank goodness, very happy for that, sober. Anyway, back in her dark days, she was taken by a, f a fellow addict to a secret bar, he said. The entrance is one of the innumerable alleyways in the French Quarter. So you have residential buildings, often between them there's an alley and then a courtyard. I mean, you had to have a way to get between the houses, and usually residents shared the courtyard. In fact, um, my family, my, well, my family have a condo there in the French Quarter, and there's an alley next to it, a courtyard that's shared with the other residents. Very nice. Anyway, um, so you see these everywhere, these alleyways, and often they're behind closed wooden doors for privacy or for security. Well, that night her addict friend knocked on one of those doors and she said that this kind of scary, large, frightening man asked for a password. The guy had it for some reason. He, he had it for that night. They entered, and the back of the alley was a door, what looked like an, a normal French Quarter residence, but they walked in and it was a bar. 
it was so dark that Jean could barely see, like really, really un unusually dark, even for a bar. But once her eyes acclimated, she saw that the bar was, you know, had a lot of people in it, but many of them were very pale and looked just different. Something was weird about them. Other people looked normal human beings, but a lot of them were very, very pale. So they were drinking red wine or something that looked like red wine. Now, I know you think, oh, gee, you know, do you get this from a movie from, from uh, you know, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, but no, this is, I mean, she told me this story. Now, she, I know her. She's, she told it to me, swore up and down it really happened. I don't know. So her addict friend introduced her to a man who called himself, himself Olivier, which is the French name for Oliver, of course. So Olivier spoke English with a French accent. <clears throat> and Jean's friend said, frankly, to her that this is a vampire bar. Olivier's a real vampire. Jean, uh, of course, said, yeah, right. But she said that Olivier had a presence about himself, like a kind of reserved coolness, the way that old um, European aristocracy held themselves. An old world way of holding himself, very reserved. He knew what to do. He was, he was charming. He shook her hand. She said his skin was very cool to the touch. Olivier seemed to enjoy the fact that Jean's face showed that she was both scared and incredulous, that she didn't believe that he was a real vampire. Uh, so he sh she said he's charming. So he said, here, you can feel my pulse. It's okay, you know. She felt his pulse and swears that he had none. Uh, he also showed her fangs. Um, she said that it really was his presence that was the real shocking thing, though. So something about it. This He had a kind of detachment from the world, a sort of observant amorality, almost like he viewed other people as things or animals or something. But that was what weirded her out, you know. She said, well, I guess you could fake the fangs, sure. I don't know how you'd fake having no pulse, cool skin, I don't know. But anyway, it was his presence. And so she was frightened. She said uh, she made excuses and left. She didn't want to stay there because, you know, whatever was going on there, it was weird. And, you know, an addict, heroin, she's probably paranoid, too. So she left. Um, she said no one ever threatened her in the bar. Everyone, Olivier was charming and accommodating, but something was just really off at this place. So she said uh, she left early, went home. <clears throat> Next day, just out of pure curiosity, she went back to try to find the place. And she had trouble identifying the exact door because alleyways everywhere, doors all look alike. She had been in the night before. She wasn't sure. She, she thought she found it. She knocked on the door. No one ever answered. That doesn't prove anything. Anyway, she told me this story. She was 100% serious about it. And I can't corroborate it. I wasn't there. It sounds ridiculous. But that's what she told me. There's a lot of stories like this in the French Quarter. In New Orleans, not just the French Quarter. All over. Garden District. Old parts of town. My point is that there are lots of vampire stories here, especially a lot in New Orleans. Are they true? Who knows? You know, I kind of want vampires to be real. <laughs> Again, like I said in the beginning, if I really faced one, I'm not sure it would be so fun. But the concept, I kind of like it. It can be romanticized, though. Uh, I think that there may be more to these stories than just invented legends, like the stories of vampires, not just the New Orleans stories, but these, all of these historical accounts of people seeing them. What do you think? Uh, I'd love to hear your comments here on YouTube below, or if you're listening on Podbean, I'm going to flash my email address up, and then I'll tell you it's um, matthew2ts.miller.writer at gmail.com, matthew.miller.writer at gmail.com. Please like and subscribe if you can. Please tell your friends about this podcast. Please let me know if there's any other topics you want me to cover. So tonight, if you go out to a bar, I mean, it's Saturday night, right? A lot of people go out and meet someone who's just a little bit too pale and whose skin is a little bit too cool to the touch. Just be careful. Thanks for watching and as always, sleep well if you can. <laughs>